We titled this panel, Moving from Welfare to Wealth, and understanding people caught in poverty, people caught in a kind of a never-ending welfare system and cycle never gives them the freedom to break through poverty. And um, that's one of the things we want to do because I know you and I both know people are in churches all over the country that are on welfare, that are trying to get off, that are trying to get ahead, that are trying to move in. Some people say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired or I'm stuck in the same place. And so um, what we're looking at is this whole system. There's been over $22 trillion dumped into this welfare system. Today we have Robert Dorff from AEI, and, uh, which is a distinguished gentleman in and of himself. But let me give you the quick rundown on him. As a mortgage fellow in poverty studies at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, he studies and, and evaluates how improved federal policies and programs can reduce poverty and provide opportunities to vulnerable Americans. There's a lot more, you can read more about them here. And then the other guy that I ran across several times, I, I got a chance to see him a couple of times uh, on a couple of different panels myself, and even when I was listening, I said, man, I like Taryn. And uh, not that I don't like Mr. Dorr either, see? <laughs> but uh, I, I really appreciate him. And uh, he has a, a, a uniqueness, but he, he's the president and chief executive of the Foundation for Government Accountability. How many people know we need government accountability? Um, and he found that in 11 and nationally recognized expert on health reform. And really, uh, he's dealt with this whole welfare issue. The, the unique thing about Taryn is that um, not only did he testify, but he you actually were in office in Maine, right? Right. 20. And And when was that? 20 years ago. 20, tw tw 20 years yeah. ago? See, I thought you said that, but I was like... You could be 20 years ago. That puts you like five. No, I'm saying. <laughs> um, but he actually ran for office and was in office and was able to make and, and help make some fundamental changes, I believe, in that state and um, gives you a whole n different perspective on uh, this system that we're caught into now. But I'm going to start with Mr. Doerr. And by the way, Senator Scott was also on our program and he was scheduled to be here. And of course, like a senator, he is, I got a note. He is trapped in a hearing currently, and um, you never know, he may show back up at some other point, but uh, that's just how those senator schedules go. So, Mr. Doerr, help me understand, um, help me understand about this whole poverty thing anyway. Where, how did we get here? What's going on? And, well, let me uh, give you a little background just on myself. Yes, so I, yes, I grew up in Washington. My father was in the Civil Rights Division of the United States Justice Department, wow. John Doerr. And he had been all across the South through the 1960s working for President Eisenhower and President Kennedy and President Johnson. And um, I watched that as a child. And I saw that good things could happen in America if we all worked together and moved forward and made changes that were desperately needed. But then we moved to Brooklyn, New York, to my father was asked to do an anti-poverty program in Bedford-Stuyvesant by Robert Kennedy. And there I saw, and he saw, and my family saw, that when it came to welfare or fighting poverty, the country wasn't going in the right direction, that we mm. weren't doing the right things. And during the 70s and 80s, really an entitlement-based welfare system that put people on cash welfare without asking anything of them in return, without expecting any dignity or, or step forwards, or, or really treating them as people that had uh, worth, Wow. Um, really brought our city down. And so poverty went up and dependency went up and there were 1.1 million New Yorkers out of 8 million New Yorkers on cash welfare. And as a young person going into what I wanted my career to be about, I wanted to be more about the first story and less about the second. Mm -hmm. And so I, I went into government right about the mid-90s when people began to say that we needed to bring work and responsibility to government assistance. And so um, I worked for Governor Pataki and then again for Michael Bloomberg for 20 years in a system that said to people seeking aid, we will help you, but you need to help yourself. Right. And you need to go to work. You need to attend a, a session of training or education where attendance will be taken. And if you fail to comply with expectations of what we think you can do, your benefits will be cut and there will be consequences because that is the way uh, the world is, and you can do it. And since then, in New York City, the welfare caseload went from 1.1 million to 350,000 when I left. Wow. So it dropped, and the real heroes of that change was not Bill Clinton or Newt Gingrich or welfare reformers. It was the people who could do it, and they just had never been asked. And so I'm often, you know, in, in programs where people say it's a jobs program or a, a program to help people 
um, uh, get ahead and move up. Uh, the person who gets the job is the person who gets the job. They have it within themselves. And when we as a country treated people as something incapable yeah. or unable to do that and without dignity, we hurt them and we held them back. And I think so for me, the key ingredient in any welfare program is to require work, require something in return, reward work. We also need to shore up wages and make those wages go further. We have to talk about family. We have to talk about the importance of two parents, active, involved, married, caring for that child for the long haul together. And we have to talk about uh, the economy because business and job creation matters too. Require work, reward work, talk about family. Yeah. Talk about family and promote a strong economy. Talk about family. Wow, so, that's a good one. I, I want to get back to yeah, that let's one. Get back Boy, to that that's one. a good yes. one. I, mm. Taryn, help me understand. Sure. You, um, government accountability, what does that mean? What are you doing there? And then I'd, I'd love to even put a snippet about how and why in the world you ran for office. Sure. <laughs> well, well uh, I'll answer that question. Uh, in just a second, let me talk to you. At the Foundation for Government Accountability, what we do is we work at the state level. While Robert's doing great work at the federal level and engaging, we want to engage with governors and state legislators on helping them reform welfare to get people out of poverty and back to work and onto a better life. And so what a lot of people don't realize is that states have really expanded the on-ramp to welfare, uh, not uh, so much on welfare cash assistance, but with food stamps, which has become the new welfare cash assistance, as well as to Medicaid. And what happens is that when you do that, it creates this really detrimental cycle because what welfare does is it doesn't punish hard work as much as it pays people not to work. Yeah. And so they don't. And they become idle and isolated. And bad things happen to people when they're idle and isolated. Right. Right. And so what we want to do through some of the reforms that Robert talked about with <clears throat> food stamps, with able-bodied adults, with uh, other time limits and making changes to welfare programs is to stop paying people not to work and instead get them back to work. Uh, and we have seen that states are really interested in these reforms. A lot of times they're just not on the radar screen of governors or state legislators. And in fact, over the last two years, 29 states have passed welfare reforms mostly focused on food stamps and putting into place work requirements or restoring work requirements in food stamps. That means about 3.4 million people will be moved off welfare most of them going back to work and getting out of poverty. Uh, I live uh, in Naples, Florida. In my home state of Florida, the number of uh, individuals on food stamps is down by 440,000 <laughs> since January of this year. And it's because That's of awesome. those work requirements and giving people dignity. <laughs> but one of the things I went through, and it was interesting just listening to some of the previous panelists, is went through this whole process where really I felt like public policy wasn't enough. And I think sometimes um, as Christians, we focus so much on public policy that it sort of abdicates our responsibility to the community. So last year we started up this sister charity called Flourish Now that works directly with churches uh, in helping them to run and expand job ministries. Uh, everything from job fairs to classes to help people with everything from resumes to interviews and to help people get back to work because I think that the church is the ultimate solution for this. Right. Uh, churches are networks of caring individuals and we need to, if you will, kind of organize that, the employers with people who want to <laughs> work uh, and we've just seen great success in this strategy and I think letting people see that poverty isn't something dealt with by politicians in some far off place. Poverty is something that you and I can engage and love our neighbor and help them get back to work. And what's more rewarding than that? Mm. I, I just want to add in sort of the federal context, that was really great, Taryn, that yeah. was terrific, is that um, for some time there had been an absence <laughs> in the debate from people on the right. I'm so sorry that Senator Scott couldn't be here because he's really filled an important void by talking about poverty and talking about work requirements and talking about a better solution than just more assistance and more yeah. government spending. And Paul Ryan has done the same. And it's a, it's a t battle here in Washington to see uh, who's going to win in that discussion. But over the last couple of years, I think due to his work and others and ours at AEI and Paul Ryan and Senator Scott, I think there's been a pushing back because we've gotten away 
from work requirements and cash in, in that started in the 90s. As food stamps has gotten so much bigger, public health insurance has gotten bigger. And people have been talking about uh, and, and downgrading jobs. I mean, there's a lot of talk about dead-end jobs or bad jobs. The fact of the matter is only 2.5% of all Americans who work full year, full time are poor. It's a tiny amount. And work is the first step out of poverty. And if you don't work, you're likely to be poor. Mm -hmm. If you do, you're likely not to be poor. Mm -hmm. And we haven't talked enough about that. There's more of that going on now in, in the discussion. Um, and we just have to keep at it because there are those who think the other way to solve poverty and help people in need, which is merely just write them a check or give them an, or sign them up for some government assistance, and that proves success. And I don't think that worked. It doesn't help people, and it really hurts families. Wow. I think just jumping off what Robert's saying, you know, when you talk about talking about family, I think this work piece is so key, and we don't make the connection. You know, my wife and I, we have four kids. We have three sons. And I feel this burden to raise good men. Yes. Like, the world needs more good men. <laughs> but if, if men aren't working, mm -hmm. then they're not marriage material. That's right. And so we talk about marriage, but we don't make this connection that he has to start taking care of himself before he's in a position to start being a provider to others. And so it is just like Robert talked about, it, work, marriage, family. And we somehow ignore this whole piece, but then expect people who aren't taking care of themselves to suddenly care about other people. And, th and this is where, not to sound preachy to an audience of preachers, but, yes. this, is, <laughs> but, but this is where I think the, you have so much power to have influence in your community because people naturally see you as the locus of caring individuals and you have the ability to reach into these communities and to help people get back to work. Mm -hmm. How many of you do any kind of jobs ministry? Nationally, it's about 2% of churches. Two-thirds of churches do handout ministries, a food pantry, a clothing store, that kind of thing. Yeah. But very few actually come alongside and say to somebody out of work, Let's help you get back to work mm. and let me network you with groups of employers in my church mm. who want to hire people who want to work. 